We uh, start up with uh, oh, just checking that the sound is working. Yeah. Today we are going to start looking into uh, partial differential equations. Partial differential uh, equations, you just switch the ordinary little d with a curl d, that's all. For the numerics, uh, there's a little bit more uh, to it. <coughs> so we start with a very, very simple one. We take um, the startup problem for a cuvette flow, for a Poisson flow. If you can recall the Navier Stokes, you have time derivative. <coughs> Then you had all these convective uh, terms, u d u d x, v d u d y, and so on. But if you have a very, very simple problem, you only have one velocity component in one direction, and this one can only be allowed to vary in the spanwise direction, in the y direction. So it's a one-dimensional uh, function in space. Then all these convective acceleration terms disappears. You don't have any of them. So the Navier-Stokes will be reduced to something like this. Now equal to something. Something what? Well, on the other side of the Navier-Stokes, actually it's Newton's second law of motion, so you had acceleration equals all the forces. Which forces do we have? Well, we could have pressure. Now if I start looking at a cuvette flow, top wall is moving with a constant velocity, big U, then it's not the pressure that is driving uh, the force, it is uh, the viscosity, the friction uh, due to the motion of the top wall. Bottom wall is standing still. So here I can now say no pressure at all. No gravity. Gravity, say, we don't uh, look into it, or it works uh, in the vertical direction. Nothing to do with the motion uh, horizontally. So what are we left with? The viscosity. Kinematic viscosity, and then double derivative with respect to y. <coughs> there we have our problem. And if I said I want a steady state, Okay, I don't have the time derivative there. Then my velocity, little u, he can vary only with y. Then you are back to an ordinary differential equation. Double derivative equal to zero. Double derivative equal to zero, that is a straight line. So here we have the steady state solution for a QET uh, flow uh, problem. But uh, here I want to address the time development. I want to keep it as a partial differential equation. How should we do that numerically? First of all, <coughs> I want to uh, get rid of any uh, constants, any parameters into this uh, problem. Here, the equation is, has been written with dimension. It's the real one. So velocity here, meters per second, meters, uh, we have seconds, we have uh, kinematic viscosity, what's that? Meters square per second. Just to mark it, that all of these, they have dimension, I use a wave on top of them. Wave meaning with dimension. Write that one on a dimensionless form. I don't want any dimensions at all. I want a non-dimensional uh, version of this one. How to do it? Well, you use the scales in the problem. Here I have a velocity, constant velocity, uh, large u, for the uh, velocity of the wall. You could also have used um, average velocity, whatever, a velocity scale in the problem. Then I can say that this Velocity, non-dimensionalized, is the real one. 
scaled with u. Distance, non-dimensional distance y equals the one I have with dimension divided by some length scale, say the distance between these two plates, it's um, an L for instance. Then I only miss time. I need something with seconds. I need a time scale in this problem. Normally, what people would do is to create a time scale given a velocity and length. I mean, here you have meters per second, and here you have meters. So if you divide them, you can get something with seconds if you want. That would be the normal way to do it. And I'm sure you all have done this in the basic course writing the entire Navier-Stokes on a non-dimensional form, and you should then achieve 1 over the Reynolds number. That you will get if you choose as a time scale, uh, the time with dimension, and now you multiply with u and divide by L. So that is one time scale we could have used here, but I don't want to. Uh, the reason will appear later. I have another time scale. I have something with seconds inside the viscosity. So this one, he is meter square per second. So if I multiply this one with the kinematic viscosity and then divide with length square, then I have a non-dimensional time. Now, why would I use such a weird uh, time scale like this? Well, <coughs> this, also called a viscous time scale, describes something uh, about, about how fast with the viscosity uh, influence the flow here in the cross stream direction. Imagine now everything is standing still, time equals zero. All of a sudden, you start moving the top wall. What's going to happen? Well, the fluid down here, due to viscosity, feel the motion of the top wall, and then you will get some strange velocity profiles, maybe something looking like this. Very high velocity here, and then zero just beneath. Then this effect, the motion from the wall, will sort of propagate down uh, here in the negative y direction, more and more, until you reach a steady state situation. That's what's going to happen. This effect sort of the propagation of, of the uh, motion uh, in the y direction, in the cross stream direction, depends on a viscous time scale. So this is a very good choice for time. If you don't believe me, just look at the following. Insert these scales into the equation. So U with a wave, that would then now be big U outside, and then derivative of the non-dimensional version of the velocity divided by then you do the same here with time with dimension so that should now be an L square and then we get the viscosity up here dt equals then on the other side I already have viscosity then I have one velocity although it's double derivative, it's still the same velocity, only one. So here I have one big u, d square of small u, non-dimensional, divided by, and then I have two uh, lengths down here. So that should now read L square, double derivative with respect to y. And then you see all these parameters disappear. You are left with only time derivative equals double derivative in space. Very neat. So here it will be a solution independent of viscosity, of velocity, of length, or whatever. You have the same solution covering any, any choice of parameters. Of course, we have to say in between the lines here, we want a laminar solution. Turbulence, uh, forget it. We can't solve it. Also then, this equation is not valid anymore for turbulence. Then you have a lot of motion in any direction, of course. Any, <coughs> any questions to this one? Yep. Uh, 
uh, just for clarification, why do the viscosity and the uh, length scale not get the wave or dimensional <coughs> scales? Uh, sorry, I didn't get that question. In the T equals uh, line, for example. Here, yeah. Uh, yeah, this, this uh, time scale has the dimension wave. Yeah. But the viscosity and the length scale do not. Ah, sorry. Um, here are sort of the independent variables. These are the dependent variables. I only have one. This one is a parameter. It's a constant physical property. So that one is the same, of course. So when I want to write it non-dimensional, I have to non-dimensionalize my variables, both the dependent and the independent. So I only need these three. How to uh, write them in a non-dimensional form? Your choice. Uh, your, you have to search for proper scales. And these are my choices here, and it turned out smart choice. Okay? Other questions? Okay, <coughs> how to find then a solution to our equation? I can rewrite it up here now. You have different uh, notations. Some like to do it like this. Some like to do it like this time derivative, space derivative. You have a lot of choices here and you find different notations in uh, every book uh, you might open. So, so people like to, uh, to play around with uh, the notation, whatever. Here, I will write it on my form. du dt equals double derivative with respect to y. That's it. My domain starts down here, zero, and go up here. Now this is this was the u with a with a dimension. Here is my non-dimensional uh, distance. Starts with zero and end in one. Of course it does. I mean, I have chosen the length scale here, so, so when y is 1, the real y will be equal to L, of course. And uh, how many uh, points do I want a solution? Now we are talking discretization of the space. Um, I want, um, how many did I want? I want uh, j max. So, in uh, numbers, <coughs> This one is number one. This one is number j max. So now you can choose how many you want. But the first one and the last one, they are sort of given in the problem. There we are talking boundary conditions. Uh, the ones in between, in between the walls, okay, they are the unknown. They are the velocities I want to find. Have you seen so far how you can write a double derivative with finite differences? I guess you've seen it. You've shown them. First <laughs> uh, only first derivative. Ah. Okay. How to create a second derivative? So here is my point uh, J, center point. I want to have a double derivative around this point, discrete version. So now you have been taught first order derivatives. Here I have point j plus 1, here I have j minus 1. How can I create a double derivative? Well, <coughs> make it simple here. I have the same distance uh, in the y direction. Delta y is constant. Make it simple. Then here I can create a derivative at that point, sort of a, a central uh, located uh, first order derivative here. How do I do that? 
Well, I take the difference u j plus 1 minus u j divided by 1 delta y. There I have a derivative at this point. Then I do the same here, between those two. What will that be? Well, that will be u j minus u j minus 1 divided by delta y. Then I want the double derivative. OK. A double derivative, I will take the first order derivative I have here minus the one I have here divided by the distance. Very easy. So that's one way to get this uh, stencil. So I will now get uh, u j plus 1 minus u j minus this one. That's minus u j minus minus becomes plus divided by delta y square. You can get the exact same recipe if you are looking at the Taylor series. I guess you're going to show them. So, so uh, don't worry, you'll see this uh, again. So this one, you have minus 2 times the center point and then plus the neighbors. It's... Uh, I need some more space here. Mm, I don't need this. <coughs> This one equals um, the double derivative, u x x if you like, and uh, it's approximative, of course it is, but it is second order accurate, delta square, or delta y square. So the arud will be of second order. <coughs> Any questions to that one? That's okay. So my double derivative, my stencil, should be then very, very easy. Say um, we start uh, with uh, a choice just to check that we are on the right track here. Uh, skip the time derivative and say I just want this one equal to zero. I just want the steady state solution first, just to make it easy. How can we do that? Well, then this one should be equal to zero. It will be an ordinary second order differential equation. This one equal to zero, what do, what do I get? Well, this one equal to zero, u double derivative or whatever you like to call it, equal to zero should then imply, um, what will it be? u j plus one, 2 times j plus uj minus 1 should be equal to 0 for all j's, right? Then how should we solve this equation system? I mean, it's uh, going to be one of these equations for every point you have here, for ev every position j. Let's do it uh, the very, very, very quick and dirty way. Treat the point, the center point, as the unknown, only the unknown. So this one, the focus point, center point, is the unknown. I sort of assume that I have the correct solution for the neighbors. I don't, of course, but uh, I, I, I pretend. Then I'll rewrite this equation to saying uj equals, just throw everything else on the other side. What do you get? You will have the average of these two guys. uj plus 1, uj minus 1, divided by 2. That's what you get. Of course, this one is not correct. So if we do this, I get, uh, say, uh, a solution that should be more correct than it was before, but it's still not correct. But if I do this many, many times for all the internal points, all the unknown points, and do it over and over and over again, shouldn't I then sooner or later reach the steady state? Let's try. So I don't need that many points here, 21. <coughs> um, I don't need the dy. No, not yet. Say, uh, 
I need you. Um, here, <coughs> I want to have an array of my unknowns, u as a function of j. So I say this one is zeros of j max comma one. <coughs> So that one should create space in memory before you begin. That's uh, the proper way to do it. You don't have to. You can start uh, inventing an, an array in the middle of your code in, in a for loop, but you shouldn't. Uh, set off some space in memory before you begin. That's sort of <coughs> the proper way. So at this point, we will have uh, a vector of our uh, velocities everybody will do zero. That's okay for my bottom point. The boundary condition here should be zero. This wall is standing still. This one, however, does not. So the boundary condition for u number j maximum, he has to be one. There I have my boundary conditions. Now I just have to be sure that I don't destroy them. I mustn't address the first and the last point. They have to sort of be protected uh, when I do the calculations. How many internal points do we have? Well, we have the, not the first one and not the last one, so we have to subtract two. And how many delta y's do we have? Mm -hmm. Well, how many do we have? We have uh, j maximum minus 1. So that should be my dy. Sadly, with MATLAB, you're not allowed to start with the index 0. You, know, you have to start with 1 or 2 or 3, but it's not 0 or negative number. So we have to do it, do it like this. <coughs> OK, then we can start a for loop for uh, j equals 2 all the way up to j maximum minus 1. Then I only touch the internal points. And then I use this stencil here and say u of j equals. And then I say he's equal to the average of the neighbors. Okay, u of uh, j plus 1 plus u of j minus 1 divided by 2. That's it. <coughs> Let's see if this one uh, works. Let's see, I need some uh, a y axis here. <coughs> I create a vector using linear space. That's a neat one, lin space. You have lin space and log space if you want to distribute points evenly. And here I want them evenly from 0 to 1. And I want uh, j maximum of them. Because now I can say plot. And what should be plot? Well. For the x position, I want the velocity and y direction is the y position, like that. So, well, I don't want that one, sorry. I don't want it inside the for loop, of course, I want it outside, like that. <coughs> So let's try it like this. <coughs> I plot them first before I begin, make a pause, hit enter, and then he do one sweep, and then we plot the next one. Let's see what happens. Uh, give him a name, okay. We can do that. Quit. So there we have our initial field. Start with zero, go all the way up here, and then the last point. 
that's my boundary condition. The 21st point up there is 1. Then we do one uh, calculation of the uh, internal fields. <coughs> well, that didn't change much, did it, did it? Well, he jumped one down, that's all that happens. So, of course, this is going to take forever to obtain the correct solution, which should be a straight line. So I have to do this many, many, many times. So uh, let's remove that one, and then we can write something uh, like for n equals 1, say, to 100. Plot. Uh, pause. End. Something like that. <coughs> now I have a double loop. My internal calculations, <coughs> updating the internal points, and then the outer, that should now be called iterations. Okay? Now let's see what happens. First one. So there you see the effect of this uh, calculation. He sort of uh, uh, propagates downwards. And finally, in the end, he should uh, tend slowly towards the steady state. So yes, you find a solution here. It takes forever, but you'll actually find it. If we remove the pause, or say draw now instead, it goes a little bit faster. <coughs> Let's undo that one. <coughs> For this problem here, I sort of programmed it without thinking. I started with 2 and uh, went all the way up to j max minus 1. But look at the physics in the problem. It's the top wall starting to move. And he uh, sort of uh, kicks off uh, the motion in the problem. He's the driving force in the problem. And the effect of this driving force is propagating downwards. Wouldn't it be smarter than to switch the, the order here? To let j go from j minus 1 with step minus 1 all the way down to 2. Or will it be the same? What do you think? Well, let's try it. That was the first one. You see, definitely, clearly, he has done a lot more uh, information, spreading the information downwards than we had it previously. So yes, this is going to go faster. So just by switching the, uh, the, the programming uh, loop, you can have something going a little bit faster. Still, <coughs> this is a very, very, very stupid way to do it. It works, yes, but uh, no, you won't uh, solve uh, uh, a problem uh, like this uh, with this method. Uh, it's possible, yes, but a uh, very, very bad idea, actually. What we are aiming for now is using the correct time development. <coughs> Remember, this was the solution for a steady-state situation. I just wanted the straight line, which I could find if I didn't did this one million times. Um, but the uh, time development here, not in time, it was iterations, they were not physically correct. They were just uh, numerics. So how to solve this one uh, with a proper scheme, also taking the time into account. You have something then called a uh, forward time, central space scheme, an FTCS scheme. That's something we are going to use a lot. It's uh, sort of the first one you'll try, given um, um, a problem involving time and space. Forward time, meaning first order Euler step, so it's a pure explicit uh, method. 
central in space, uh, the one uh, I used here to create a second derivative. It's uh, centered around some uh, focus points that you, that you use. Uh, it's normally higher order than if you use a forward or a backward difference. But uh, you will be, be taught more of that in, in class. So here I want first order in time, I want second order in space. And the equation I want to solve is now the top. I want to have the time as well. How can we write that one? <coughs> time derivative, then I'm looking at the velocity at point J in space. Now I need something uh, to write uh, what time level am I looking at. Here I used N as iteration number. So now let's continue. We're using N as the number of time step. So here I will now have the new velocity, time level n plus 1. That's the un unknown. Then first order uh, forward time, we have minus the old velocity at the same point. But uh, the time level uh, should be an n, n <coughs> divided by delta t. There you have a first order Euler step. <coughs> equals. And now on the other side, <coughs> what do you get? Double derivative. Okay, that would now be j plus 1, time level n. Remember, first order Euler, that's an explicit uh, method. Everything now on the right hand side should be old values from the previous time step, the time step n. Uh, I want j plus 1, I have minus two times the center point j, time level n, and finally plus j minus 1, time level n, divided by delta y square. <coughs> so this is my FTCS scheme. Any questions of that one? Good. <coughs> Now uh, rewrite it a little bit. Uh, take delta t on the other side, multiply up, and also remove this old one on the other side. Uh, what do we get? Delta t divided by delta y square. He will uh, uh, inflict all these three terms here. So I will baptize him uh, to something else. Mm, I think I go up here again. <coughs> so delta t divided by delta y square equals r. Then we can write this uh, equation here as the new one, n plus 1, equals and then everything on the other side. What will we get? Where's this one? Uh, sorry, that was j, n plus 1, equals. First of all, <coughs> You get the center point, you have it here, but you have it here as well. So that will now be this guy multiplied with 1 minus 2 times r. Ujn, 1 minus 2 r. Everybody with me on that one? This one on the other side will become the 1. <coughs> this one, minus 2 multiplied with r which is delta t by delta y square, okay? These two guys, <coughs> j plus and minus 1, they are only multiplied with the r alone. So now let's see how we can write those. So that will now be r multiplied with uj plus 1 plus 
uj minus 1. So here we now have our stencil, our recipe, which then is easy to program directly, as it is. So let's try this. <coughs> We have to uh, decide the maximum time here, T maximum. What should that one be? Well, here comes the nice thing with writing your equations non-dimensional. You know the time scale before you begin. The time scale will be of order one. The physics in the problem, the dynamics, is going to happen on a time scale of one. So you could use 10 if you would be dead certain to cover all the, all the dynamics. But uh, here I'm pretty certain, uh, certain I should reach a steady state or pretty close to at ti uh, time level 1. Then <coughs> I need a choice. What should the time step be? Now we run into problems. Time step, that can be a crucial choice here. Too big is going to explode, too small is going to take forever. And uh, just for now I have no idea, so we are guessing something, just to see what happens. Now I can define my parameter r, should be uh, delta t divided by delta y square. So now I have that one, and then we should be ready to go. Yeah, we don't need that plot sentence, do we? Remove that one. But I have to change this uh, recipe of mine here. So you see now, it has become a little bit more uh, mm, complex, uh, complicated. I have these two guys already, but now they shouldn't be divided by two. I should have R multiplied with them. And furthermore, I should have u of j multiplied with um, 1 minus 2 times r. So this one should be the correct recipe. <coughs> Everybody with me on that one? That's too bad, because it's wrong. What's wrong? <coughs> U of J? Yeah, it's supposed to be the new value. So I can do this, I can write it like this. But here I now overwrite my velocity all the time. Furthermore, whether you go forward or backwards shouldn't matter anymore. I mean, now we should have the correct time development no matter what. Here, it will be very differently uh, which way we choose to do this, uh, this loop. So, no, you can't really do this. You can't overwrite your, your unknowns directly. This is going to be wrong. So, first of all, let's rewrite this one to the nice way. Then I have to, I have to give him another name, a temporary name or something. I can call him uh, a new U. Now it's correct. The new one is based on only the old values regardless how you do the programming here, it doesn't matter. Now it should be correct. To make it nice, I should give the new u also the uh, correct values, let's say here. New u equals u. <coughs> That's a quick way to uh, duplicate uh, an array, and here I do it on purpose after I have inserted the boundary condition as well. Now I have the same correct boundary condition inside this new U. 
because I'm, no, I'm never going to address uh, j equal to 1. So, uh, so uh, he should be well protected. Also, the first one, u number 1, which is 0, he is also protected because you start with 2. Because now, after you have updated all your uh, velocities, then you can uh, sort of update him and prepare for the next time step in one command. <coughs> now it should be uh, correct. Everybody agrees on that? <coughs> okay. Let's try it and see what happens. Ah, my program has already paused. Crash him. Okay, this one looks a little bit strange, doesn't it? Now well, let's try one more. I already have a velocity of 4. Doesn't look promising. No, this is uh, not something that I'm convinced of can be right. And we are now to the 10 to the power of 9 already, and uh, I haven't done many iterations. It explodes, totally. Why? Have I done something wrong, or what? Well, the problem is the time step. You have to choose it. or But you have to choose it wisely. I said, too big. Delta t is going to explode too small, then it's going to take forever. So let's try a really small one here and see. Yeah, now it looks uh, okay. He doesn't explode at least. Ah, oh, but it's going to take forever. I have to kill this one. <coughs> so yes, you can play around here now with. Uh, with uh, delta t's and see draw now and see which one is good, <coughs> which one is bad. That one, well, should we believe him? I have a time. Uh, ah, yeah, that's an, another point here. <laughs> he stopped after 100 time steps what should the number there be how many time steps do we need to reach maximum time of one well you choose a time step then you can say how many time steps do you need n max so i write n maximum here well if you have the maximum time and you know your time step, you can just divide these two guys with each other. That is not so good because they are both real numbers and uh, I want an integer to have a correct control here. So uh, I have to round off this one and just to be sure that I get uh, maximum time, I write ceiling like that. Now, for uh, cosmetic reasons, I might want to, uh, well, not here, after the plot, <coughs> I want to know what's, what is the time. So I use that as, uh, I use the title. Inside the title, I'm going to put a string that contains uh, the time. So that's the way to do it. Time equals comma and then you have something called num to string numerics to string and the numerics I will use n multiplied with delta t there you will have a real number and I only want to have a two digits precision I just want to have a title telling me if I'm getting close to the maximum time or not let's see if this one runs There we go. 
Yeah, it works. And it's stable. It doesn't explode. So now uh, my delta t is small enough. But uh, he's not finished. So uh, we take a break. Any questions? We take a break. He can stand and run in between in the meantime.